Shaker. I'm Terence Chu, Senior Manager, Planning and Operations for RMIT Digital 3. Welcome to the launch of RMIT Digital 3. Before we start this evening, I've asked a few people what the digital economy means to them. Let's see what they've got to say. The digital economy is a frontier set of tools that are fundamentally disrupting the way we live and work. The digital economy is sort of an extension of the economy that we already have in the physical world. To me, it's about transformation at a, a society level. Moving from the bricks and mortar uh, of traditional economy, the sort of the, the red brick establishments, to being more online. A digital economy is something that is basically a computer all the way down and that's an incredible way to um, drive new technologies and um, new, sort of, uh, new, new sources of productivity into an economy. I think it's going to be an extension of yourself in the Web3 world. For me, digital economy is about uh, conducting economic activities in a digitally empowered way. It involves the economic activities that result from everyday online connections among people, business and devices. Business in a digital economy, it's not different, it just has, you're doing the same thing but with more options. Web3 is an open access distributed network, placing the power in the hands of the individuals who access it. And that means digital signatures, trusted information, registries, and so on. We've now got an opportunity to reimagine how we do business. And I believe that we are with D3 starting that journey so that we can give the very best education to our students. As a society, we can increase economic inclusion and freedom and empowerment by adopting the digital economy. That we can harness the technology to bring about greater equality. People will have a lot more opportunity to collaborate and organise and take agency over their own stuff. Web3 is the future. Web3 is a decentralised, permissionless economy where people are the masters of their own fate and their own destiny. And at RMIT, we're committed not just to operating in the digital economy, but we are shaping it and designing it. And we're doing that through D3. Good evening and welcome everybody. My name is Frank Kennedy and I'm really proud to be director of Digital 3 and to welcome you to RMIT Capital Theatre. This theatre is steeped in history, but it's adapted for the future. We could not have a more beautiful nor appropriate venue to launch RMIT Digital 3 or as it's affectionately referred to, D3. Embedded in digital technology and economies, we are an aggregator and integrator of multiple research centres to provide insights, research, innovations, short courses and future talent for business, social impact and communities. This evening is all about digital economies. And we will hear from directors of three of our research centres. We have the opportunity to engage with industry representatives through a panel and to highlight opportunities to partner and benefit from Digital 3. Before I commence, I have some housekeeping. The first is that the restrooms are outside in the foyer and they're on your right. Use this QR code to submit any questions that you may have either for our industry panel, and this will come up once more, or for any of us within Digital3 and RMIT. Please keep your phones silent during the event. This event is being recorded and you'll have an opportunity to view that on our websites. And for those who are able to, please stay for our networking and events and um, refreshments, which will be in the salon on the top floor. I would now like to introduce Daniel Ross to conduct the Welcome to Country. Daniel is a proud 
Wurundjeri man, and I'd like to now welcome Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. My name is Daniel Ross, and I'm a proud Wurundjeri man. I don't really like standing behind a microphone. My ancestors didn't use them either. So if I step away from it, don't be alarmed. I'd like to start by acknowledging my ancestors, past, my elders present, and extend my respects to everybody here and acknowledge your elders past and present. You're probably looking at me and saying, yeah, he's, I looked on Google before and he doesn't look like he's an Aboriginal. I'll get there. I'll tell you a little bit of story about my family and how I'm here today. This is my ancestors home, my home, Nam. Before you fellas got here a couple of hundred years ago, we had light shows like this all the time, just not on the ceiling. That leads into who we are. But from contact on our home, we're forced off to places like Bolan Bolan Billabong, where the squatters go, these fellas are getting fat. And they pushed us off our country again and established Corin Dirk, the mission. At the mission, we had to learn to read and write English before we could get a paycheck. We had Uncle Simon Wonga negotiate the first treaty. Uncle William Barak advocating for the betterment of our people. Uncle Barak gave my great grandmother the name, tribal name of Bulumbulum, white butterfly. The old people, they had a way of knowing. I don't know how, but think of a little white butterfly in your garden at home. It's gentle, it's caring. My great grandmother went on to open the first health service for Aboriginal people here in Gertrude Street. Just this extra sense of knowledge. And my great grandfather, 70, oh, my grandfather, 76, he stepped aside from cultural engagements during COVID. So I've got some damn big shoes to fill. But one I take with great pride. And I missed a few things to get to this point, like the 67 referendum where we voted on being human. I don't understand that. But to put into context how long we've been on this landscape, there's a place near Warrnambool that suggests human occupation at around 120,000 years right here in Victoria. We've been, past, we've been here since the beginning of time. Beginning of time, it's a strange concept, time. We've, we all go somewhere and feel like we've been there before. But our creator, Bunjil, set those laws for us when he created everything. And when I say everything, there's stories of our dreamings of the Milky Way. Not that you can see it now in Melbourne because of the sky and light pollution. But if you've got a creative mind and you look at it, it kind of looks like an emu. When an emu stands up, you knew you could take the eggs. But when it laid down, it was nesting. You didn't touch the eggs. We've just come out of a season called Pornite, when the wattle blooms. We look after our elders. Uncle Jack Charles, Archie Roach, Annie Margaret Gardner, to name a few. But it's a time for new beginnings as well. One where we see yam, uh, yam daisies starting to flower, tadpoles in ponds. So it's good to keep that season in check and reflect on what everyone's doing here today. New beginnings, innovation. We didn't live on a landscape for millennia to not be innovative. And to put that into context, a couple of years ago, we had these fires up the west co east coast. And now we've got government departments coming to us asking, how did you manage country? You never had fires so hot. So it's important to listen, moving forward as one collectively that we listen to the needs of each other, how we come together as one. The essence of Aboriginal culture is connecting not only to country, but to one another. I'd like to welcome everybody to my home, my ancestors' home. Woman Jika Wurundjeri Bullock, Yemen Gundibek. In the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people, the Woiwurrung, I just said welcome to the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. Our traditional lands go west to the Werribee River, north to the Great Divide, east to Mount Borbore, and south to Mordialic Creek. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Daniel, for that beautiful welcome to country. I'd also like to acknowledge the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung traditional owners of the lands that RMIT operates within, and also to, and their elders past and present, but also to acknowledge our sister campus in Vietnam and the traditions, the peoples and the culture of Vietnam. We're also really proud that Daniel is a alum of RMIT. So this is just an example of staying connected, but also we're, RMIT is very proud of our small contribution to reconciliation and continuing the story of innovation. I would now like to invite Professor Alec Cameron, who is our RMIT University's Vice-Chancellor and President, to make some opening remarks. Welcome, Alec. Uh, Frank, thank you very much for your welcome. And Daniel, thank you very much for your welcome to country. Um, distinguished guests, colleagues, partners, RMIT students, staff, alumni and friends. It's a great pleasure to be part of this important event and to be back in this wonderful venue, which we obviously showed off with a light show at the start. Um, for those who don't know, the capital dates back to 1924, and this theatre was designed by legendary architects Walter Burley Griffin and Marion Marnie Griffin, who were, of course, best known in Australia for their master plan for Canberra. This building, the Capitol, is considered their greatest interior work and was described by Robin Boyd, renowned Australian architect and RMIT alumnus, as the best cinema that was ever built and is ever likely to be built. Originally, patrons came to experience silent moving pictures uh, with a full orchestra and the first large Wurlitzer organ in Australia. Later generations came for movies like The Towering Inferno, where the ceiling lighting was programmed to highlight dramatic moments in the film. And in recent years, it's been restored by RMIT for a new generation of audiences. Because it's in RMIT's DNA to use our resources, talent and partnerships to make a positive contribution to the communities who we serve. And it's timely that we've just launched our new strategy at RMIT called Knowledge with Action that carries that express purpose, which is exactly what brings us here today. We have been a practical institution of learning since our earliest days, 135 years ago, and we remain so. A university that sees education as the foundation of a civil and prosperous society, and research as society's best means to address current and future challenges that we will face. This being true, we are duty bound to have a strong focus on keeping up with the times in which we live. In recent years, there have been great challenges and I'm very proud of our response. Since I joined RMIT in January this year, I've had the good fortune to visit our locations around the world and to meet the passionate team in Vietnam and in Spain, as well as partners across Asia and beyond. Everywhere I go, it's evident that these are incredibly complex times and our purpose and the collective contribution we make is more important than ever. Our world is a very different place than it was seven years ago when RMIT's last strategy came to be. The World Economic Forum now estimates that 70% of new value created in the economy over the next decade will be based on digitally enabled business models. And when, and, when, and when analysing activity from 2019, the Australian government estimated the cost of cybercrime in Australia at $3 billion. But I think everyone who reads the news would expect that the cost to the economy has significantly increased since. So at RMIT, we begin our next chapter firmly in the era of the digital economy. The average hours spent engaging with digital media personally and professionally continue to grow. Uh, naturally, therefore, so does the use of the internet, the rate of tech adoption, and the prevalence of artificial intelligence systems in our day-to-day -day activities, both visible and invisible. 
and growth requires and attracts money. So venture capital investment in ICT, digital and related services has grown exponentially on, alongside customer adoption. Unfortunately, the opportunity of financial gains also attracts crime and corruption, and there's no doubt that criminals have been very active in exploiting opportunities in the digital economy. Within this context and with deep subject matter expertise, RMIT's Digital 3 brings together world-leading academics, research centres, thought leadership and collaborative partnership to address real-world problems. My strong personal bias is towards research and partnership for practical application that improves lives or solves important problems. RMIT's new strategy looks ahead nine years but addresses planning and priorities within three-year horizons. I mention this because it points to the fact that we cannot accurately predict the long term, particularly with the rapid development of technology and associated business models. We can set our course with certain expectations, but the experience of recent years has made it abundantly clear that the expected can and will happen. However, we can make some strong predictions within shorter time frames, and we have an obligation to do so and to prepare our communities accordingly. In our new strategy, we talk about creating ecosystems in the truest sense of the world. Our ecosystems will be active living networks made up of many people from different professions, disciplines, and nationalities. This partnership approach will underpin our capacity for research excellence, collaboration, and accelerated translation of what we discover into positive impact. The outcome will be research centers and impact-focused networks and platforms that will drive engagement and collaboration to solve urgent, complex problems. I won't steal Frank's thunder and speak to the detail of RMIT's Digital 3 offering, but I will say this. RMIT is Australia's largest tertiary education institution with almost 100,000 students. We need to ensure that our ambition matches our potential, and given our scale, our ambition should be significant. The digital economy has become larger than we ever imagined possible at a pace we could not have foreseen. Digital 3 is a critical response to the times in which we live and for the communities where we operate around the world. And importantly, it brings together RMIT's strengths as a multidisciplinary global university. It cuts across boundaries and it proactively invites collaboration. And this is exactly what RMIT is about. I very much look forward to discovering what's possible, and I want to congratulate everyone involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alec, for not only um, acknowledging RMIT's role in digital economy in the world of the future, but also um, for welcoming the Digital 3 family and the collaboration that exists across Australia and Vietnam. Digital, digital technologies impact every aspect of our working and personal lives, sometimes in areas that we wouldn't expect. They can expose issues, create opportunities, as well as being part of a solution. Managing through the current, preparing for the future, and imagining frontiers requires an assimilation of multiple perspectives and disciplines. And we would like to share with you some of our insights this evening. And we'd like to do that through three presentations. So first of all, I'd like to welcome to the stage Jason Potts. Jason is co-director of RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub, and his work is broadly centred about the study of the creation and use of new knowledge, for example, techno technological change and its institutional context as the core explanation of long-run economic transformation. Please join us on stage. I'd now like to welcome Matt Warren onto the stage. 
Matt is the Director of RMIT Centre for Cyber Security Research and Innovation. And Matt is a Professor of Cyber Security at RMIT. Matt leads the cyber security aspects of Digital 3 and he works with the Australian Safety Commission to consider the impact of cyber safety. Welcome, Matt. And I'd like to now introduce Shelley Marshall. Shelley is director of RMIT Business and Human Rights Centre. Shelley draws on her 25 years of expertise in corporate accountability and business and human rights to examine how digital tools and technology advance social impact for business, social enterprises and humanitarian organisations. Welcome, Shelley. And I'd like to hand over to Jason first. Thank you very much. Um, look, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming to this. We're incredibly super excited, super pumped um, to be here and to launch this because we're building something new. And what we're, the reason we're doing this is we're building this new thing because of the environment that we find ourselves in. And I want to describe that as today we're living through a revolution. And that revolution right now is a tech revolution, um, but it's also an economic revolution. We've got two revolutions at the same time. And what, we've just, what, what the purpose of D3 is to enable us to sort of try and rethink how we rebuild a business school to address the needs and demands and applications of these, of these joint revolutions. We, we need to do something new, and D3 is what we're proposing. So this revolution is a super cluster of digital tech. Um, sometimes called Web3, we've styled it as Digital3 or D3 um, within that story. And this tech revolution isn't a sort of steam engines and plastics and flying cars and colonies on Mars, a sort of not an industrial tech revolution. Um, it's not a space age revolution. Um, it's something that's actually much closer to these slides that I'm presenting here, which have been all made by DALI. That's the sort of latest generation of transformer AI models that have leapt onto the scene in the past year or so. Um, slides fully made by, by robots. But that, that kind of just bringing digital tech directly into our lives is, is the type of thing that we're building here. This super tech cluster, as I want to style it, um, is one that combines crypto, blockchain, that's, 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 that's my area and my team's one. It's cloud, it's AI, it's IoT, it's um, low latency communication, it's VR, it's, it's, it's metaverse. It's this full tech stack has just suddenly appeared in the world in the past decade, um, not one at a time, but just all at once. We got them all, all, we got them all together. And that tech revolution isn't just better, faster, cheaper computers. It's not on the same trajectory of just a bunch of things speeding up. Um, it's, it's, it's something that is much closer to what St. Mark um, called software is eating the world. Um, you know, it's, but it's still not that. It's, 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 not just, it's not just software and ICT and communications. It's a step beyond that. What it is is much closer to where we're putting this and the way we're arranging it and who we're using it on and, and, and so on. And that revolution I want to describe as... Um, it's a refactoring or operating system upgrade of the economy. We're getting a new operating system for the economy. That's what this full sort of tech stack revolution is, is bringing us. And weirdly at the core of that, of that sort of operating system upgrade of, the, of, the, of this, this digital economy is bringing a, a thing that is very, very low tech. It's, it's bringing consensus about common knowledge. Right. That's, the, that's the revolution here, this idea of, of um, very, very low-cost common knowledge about facts, just really boring administrative facts about who is that person, um, who owns this cow. Um, just every time a transaction occurs in the economy, that those boring administrative behind-the-scenes facts, administrative facts update. That's distributed ledger technology. A ledger is the millennial old technology that we use for recording facts and that tech hasn't changed in a thousand years until suddenly it did about 11 years ago and 
that um, you know, this is the least sexy tech revolution we've ever had. It's it's one that is basically accounting just got like way better. Um, but when you combine that with this full digital stack of all of the other things coming in over the top of that, we have the revolution that will be before us. And the nature of that revolution is the industrialization of trust. Um, we can take a thing that was previously handcrafted and handmade person by person, peer to peer, um, in small communities, and we scaled it up with enormous cost and difficulty. And suddenly, in a very short space of time, we've automated that, we've industrialized that, we've pushed that to a global scale. And that's the revolution we've got before us right now, the industrialization of trust, which gives us this lift in the operating system of a global economy, which is built up on this tech stack, um, this, this super cluster of digital tech, um, blockchain being one of them, but it's, it's just, just one of the, of the tech stack parts of this. So that industrialization, and you know, thank you, Satoshi, whoever you, she, they are. Um, what does that do? Um, the basic economics of it, it massively lowers the cost of trust. And the economists in the room will know demand curves slope downwards. When you lower the cost of something, you lower the price of something, you increase the demand for something, you use more of it. When we dramatically lower the cost of trust, we use a lot more trust. And that's a really good thing. Trust is, a, is, a, um, is, a, is the input into cooperation and coordination at global scale. So we've just industrialized trust that has given us the ability to cooperate and coordinate using this amazing digital tech stack at scale. That just happened on our watch. Um, and that's, that's, um, that's what we're adapting to. So we've seen the first phase of this, that was ICT, that was computers, the internet. Um, that did that for communication. Communication got better, faster, cheaper, the cost of it went to zero. And what happened? We used it for everything. We do more of it. We spend all of our lives there. We just did it for trust. Um, we're in the very early stages of the experimentation of, of how blockchains can do that. So that's the... That's the way we, um, we, we do this with, with, with the development of common knowledge, um, the development of institutional facts and ways of, of, of bringing those, um, that common knowledge into what we want to call a computable economy. And the idea of a computable economy is what happens when we join up all of these digital technologies, this full digital stack into digital economic institutions. And that's the transition that gives us a fully 21st century economy that is digital in its institutional tech stack from top to bottom. We've never had that before. The ICT digital revolution started us down this path. But that got us as far as communication. It didn't get us all the way to being able to have a full um, upgrade of the operating system of an, of, of an economy. So that's the nature of the revolution that we're going through right now. We're, we're still in the very, very early days of it. We're 10 years in, more or less, um, on that. But this is a revolution to a computable economy with a full digital um, institutional stack. So that's the deep disruption that D3 is built to guide us into. How do we rebuild our understanding of business and social enterprises and all of the sort of things where human beings come together to cooperate and do fun things? Um, that's where we are. So that's the nature of the revolution that we've got. Um, Blockchain Innovation Hub was, was an exercise that sort of started um, this. Um, what we did initially sit five years ago was um, we were the first in world business the first in the world sort of business school to do this um, it's something we we're incredibly proud of we pioneered a bunch of new fields institutional crypto economics crypto democracy um, web3 governance and, and and so on as we build through that we've built a world-class research center that last year was ranked second in the world um, hitting, beating Stanford and Harvard and, and MIT and, 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 and the competition in that space. That's, that's, we're, inc again, incredibly proud of what we've done. Um, we've built an agile, um, expert, high performing interdisciplinary research team that is delivering not just, not just fantastic research, but deep industry and public engagement. Um, we've been doing this now for five crypto years, which is about 400 years in, in, in regular time. Um, we're battle tested now. Um, battle tested, think hobbits, not, not soldiers, um, in that sense. But 
what we've done is, you know, we've been on a, a lot of big adventures together over the past um, five years, really learning a lot about how to use these, these technologies, how they work from an innovation perspective. Um, we've fought some monsters, we've had all sorts of adventures, and, and now that this is sort of, we're incredibly proud to be part of the next step in, in, in developing out the rest of the, um, the full digital tech stack that we have here. So um, what we have is we're um, industry engaged in, in this process. We've been working with, with, with industry to, to develop this. Um, we've been building out a, a lot of different sort of, you know, in terms of where we go next with this. Um, you know, we're knowledge with action. Um, what, uh, the purpose of, of what we're trying to do is to take this, 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 um, these understandings that we've built and to develop them into new research fields and new, new applications that we can see. Um, this is just a short example of just the number of, pr of, the, of the areas that we're working in at the moment. Um, I'll leave you to sort of read through and think about what that means. But the, the, the idea is, is that we are, we are fundamentally an interdisciplinary research team that has combined a lot of skills and capabilities to take on a whole lot of new projects that don't sit neatly inside individual disciplines or individual fields. Um, again, this is what D3 is for, is to enable us to go after these, these types of things. Um, so what we have coming up next um, is that this notion of we're going to take all of those capabilities and put that together. Um, we're building, we're building the capabilities to sort of try and rebuild this, 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 an economy as a computer. And what that means is, if you think of a, the operating system as a stack of rules, some of those rules are behavioral, some of them are habits and routines, some of them are organizational rules, some of them are code. Um, some of them are institutions and legislation, that full stack is becoming increasingly digital. And as it becomes increasingly digital, anything digital can talk to anything else digital. So we start to have this, this sort of full stack computable economy. And that's what we're, that's what we're driving towards here. And what that looks like in practice, um, the next step on this is, is we need to integrate, we need to make everything digital. That's what tokenization is. So the crypto started off as a money. Um, it's, it's evolving into a way of just keeping track of all of the things, providing a bridge between the physical and the digital. And again, this is sort of where we're up to now with this process of building a, 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 um, a computable economy with its composable digital parts that we can put together um, to, to build a new digital operating system, not just for economies as nation state objects, but the natural scale of this is global. This is the scale of the internet. Um, we're, we're, we're in the process of building a new type of digital economy that exists, um, that is born global. And we need to prepare ourselves for that. We need to figure out how to do this well. So this brings us to the sort of frontiers that we're working with now. Um, the main way to think about this is that this sort of integration of, of blockchain into this full digital tech stack with tokens and DeFi and NFTs and DAOs and all of the other sort of digital technologies as they move on out. Um, what this looks like is that we're increasingly becoming a design school. And that was an unexpected surprise to us as we worked through this. We spend more and more time designing economies. Now, these aren't economies in the nation state. There's 192 of them since. These are economies in the sense of spin-up, pop-up economies that are built when a group of people come together and want to cooperate, to create value, and they need tools to do it. Those tools are this digital stack. That, we, that we've entered into. So that notion of some of these are virtual economies and will exist in the metaverse. Some of these are physical digital interactions where we'll use parts of the, um, we'll, we'll take the best of both. But where we are now in the, in, in the timeline is the process of joining this all together, creating all of these capabilities and these tool sets and these toolkits that, that we, can, we can use to stack this, the, these economies. And using that to um, essentially turn um, what we have, these capabilities of our students working with industry partners, um, building courses and so on, to integrate that into what feels a lot like a design institution um, as a new sort of vision of what a digital business school can, can look like. So that's what we're doing going forward. And with that, I will welcome Matt to the stage.
Excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, Jason, uh, for that overview about D3. So I'm Matt Warren uh, from the uh, Center for Cybersecurity Research and Innovation. And really, in terms of my presentation for the work that we're doing in regards to D3, what I'm going to talk about is, is a journey. So in terms of ourselves, our center, we're very much focused about protection. So protection of data, protection of society. And what D3 has done for us is help us develop new relationships with government to help protect people, to help protect data. And really, my presentation is going to be about that journey, about that partnership, and this concept of safety by design. So safety by design or online safety covers so many areas in terms of cyberbullying, in terms of scamming, identity thefts, fake news, cyber stalking. It impacts everyone and it's going to impact everyone into the future. These items of clip art on the screen no human actually generated. I actually uh, used an, an AI art creation system and just put in cyber safety, and these were you know, the free images the AI system generated. So we live in a situation where actually you know, humans no longer need to make art. We've got computer systems that can do it for us. In terms of the real world, we're now seeing in the situation in the Ukraine, the application of fake news and artificial intelligence to try to change you know, the way that people see the world or misinterpret the facts. This you know, is a first generation of AI in fake news. What we're gonna see in you know, three to five years is a situation online that we're gonna have difficulty telling what is fake, what is true because of the sophistication. In terms of an Australian context, we partnered with the eSafety Commissioner of Australia as part of this journey. And again, it was about the importance of cyber safety and how we protect Australians and citizens, not just now, but into the future. Cyber safety is a major issue. That much show in uh, 2021, we have the Online Safety Act that gives the eSafety Commissioner the power to protect Australians online. So our journey was about how to build safety into systems, not just at the moment, but into the future. Would you buy a car and then once you've got your car, buy an engine afterwards or buy some tires. But that's actually what happens at the moment with software and apps is people, you know, put, uh, companies develop apps and then afterwards they then build security, they build online safety into those apps. And this is the problem we're facing. You just have to turn on the news today you know, to read about the examples that are happening in Australian companies to show that safety and security is one of the key issues that are facing us, not just now, but into the future. So with our centre, we're very much an applied centre. We work with industry and government. And as part of the D3 initiative, what we did was reach out to our partners. So we reached out to our partners uh, within the office of the safety commissioner. We had a conversation with them about what D3 is and what it means into the future and how it relates to them in terms of what they think you know, is an important issue. And what I'm gonna be talking about is this concept of safety by design. And this is through the D3 initiative is the journey that we've been on. So what we've done is developed, you know, it's going to be the first course in the world that actually embeds this concept of safety by design. 
an Australian fust, a way in which safety can be built into every application, every software program, every form of technology, with safety actually uh, driving that design process. And the focus is being able to uh, you know, develop those training courses in a way it can be di distributed to a global audience. So what we've been do doing over the past months is working with the eSafety Commissioner to design a course that actually encompasses safety by design, that actually teaches the principles, teaches the importance, gives a very holistic overview of why safety online is so important. And what we're doing is developing this course about why e-safety and online safety is important, about the principles of safety by design, about how industry can take this concept, not just now, but into the future, in terms of developing technology. And what's important, as Jason uh, mentioned, is we're going to have a whole range of new technologies coming. But by applying these approaches, it doesn't matter about the technology, safety will be embedded into all of those future systems. So in conclusion, what the D3 initiative has done is allowed us to think about what does the future hold? It's allowed us to reach out to government to partner with the eSafety Commission. It's allowed us to think about future technology and how to keep people safe when using those future technologies. And what we will have is a main you know, outcome initially of the D3 initiative, and this is, is going to grow into the future, is the first course in relation to this safety by design concept, this first stage in taking safety by design into a global context. And you know, we've been talking to the eSafety Commissioner how this relates to the global initiatives of safety by design. Unfortunately, I can spend hours talking about this, and my colleagues know that uh, I often will, but uh, time is uh, against me, so it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Shelley. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Um, I can't see Daniel anymore, but I wanted to start by thanking Daniel for his really meaningful um, welcome to country and to acknowledge any First Nations um, peoples who have joined us this evening. And also to say hello to all of the wonderful people who have come tonight. Thank you. So I caught the red eye um, back from Indonesia on Monday. I've been in Indonesia for the past month studying the use of digital technologies and ICT to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And for those of you who aren't in the sustainability um, and development world, the Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs uh, represent the world's aspirations for peoples and the planet's well-being with a deadline of uh, 2030. So not much time. Along with other countries in Asia, Indonesia made enormous gains in poverty reduction, cutting the poverty rate from more than half between 1999 to under 10% in 2019. And so that meant that Indonesia was on track to meet goal one, end poverty in all its forms everywhere. And 2020 was supposed to mark the decade, the decade of action to reach the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. And then COVID happened. Indonesia went from upper, upper middle income 
to lower middle income status as of July 2021. And it's visible. Being there, it's visible and it's palpable. Because of the link between poverty and slash and burn or subsistence farming, as well as cuts to the fire brigade across Indonesia to deal with the, um, lo the losses to the economy because of COVID, forest loss in Indonesia rose 50% in the first 20 weeks of 2020, compared with the same period just the year before, because Indonesia was making amazing gains in terms of dealing with deforestation. So that's a loss of rainforest that plays a critical role in carbon storage, the size of Singapore every week over that period. The terrible setbacks of the pandemic coupled with the Russian war against Ukraine, mean that it's time for all of us to rally behind the global effort to reach the SDGs by 2030. And one of the best things about the Sustainable Development Goals, and it's a really big uh, improvement on its predecessor, the Millennium Goals, is that they provide a role for all of us. So whereas the Millennium Goals were the responsibility of government, the SDGs put business, civil society and universities at the heart of efforts. And I'm really proud to say that RMIT University has answered that call. The SDGs are now at the core of our teaching and also our operations. But to make up for lost ground, to make up for the devastating losses that occurred to us personally and to economies as well, we not only need to galvanise the private and public sectors, we also need to harness new tools. And that's why D3 is so imperative. D3 explores how to harness the digital revolution, which Jason just so uh, succinctly but excitedly described for us. But as a human rights scholar, the study of this digital revolution has been an emotional roller coaster, literally, like every day. I feel like I go from incredible excitement to just kind of horror. So, for example, we only know about the scale of forest loss in 2020 in Indonesia because of the use of satellite images and data analysis by I think the unfortunately named Global Land Analysis and, Analysis and Discovery Organization, which has the acronym GLAD. Indonesia is teeming with Russians on the run from compulsory conscription in the military because it's one of only a handful of nations that are allowing young men who don't want to fight Ukrainians in. Their money is locked in Russian banks because of the sanctions. So, of course, they're turning to cryptocurrencies to get their money out. But this undermines the system of money tracking that underpins sanctions, the strongest international tool to support the human rights of Ukrainians. And that might be fine if it was only Russians who were conscientious ob objectors, but the reality is that it's the Russian government and oligarchs that are uh, this technology's big beneficiaries right now. And if banks are the eyes and ears of governments in relation to money laundering and sanction avoidance, the explosion of digital currencies is blinding them. The time for unbridled optimism about the digital revolution has passed. It's time to move past the hype. There's a critical need for studies of the implementation of digital innovation for good to find out what works, what doesn't, what was hype, what hampered the rolling out of initiatives that look good on paper but failed in reality. At the RMIT Business and Human Rights Centre, we bring together a team of ICT and human rights specialists to conduct this examination. And I want to really quickly just share two of our case studies with you now. The first was conducted by Mohammed Hossein. Put your hand up, Mohammed. He's our lead on digital technologies. He studied the use of social media to empower Bangladesh's third gender community. 
So the risk of social exclusion and other human rights breaches are greatest in Bangladesh for non-cisgendered women, known in the local language, and apologies for the way I'm about to pronounce this, as hijras. People who are assigned male at birth and identify as female later. They're openly discriminated, harassed, and often tortured. Hijra are commonly placed under great pressure by their families, and consequently, many are compelled to leave their families. They're bullied um, and mocked at school, and consequently, most end up dropping out of the education system. And that takes them to dwellings known as dera, commanded by a guru. The guru, guru requires them to earn money through sex work and ritual performances. The guru takes a big cut of their earnings, leaving them uh, with little money and fear of retribution and lack of options if they try to leave. So Dr. Hussain's study found that social media has been a lifesaver for this community and a pathway away from these exploitative gurus. Social media has allowed hijras to develop, understand, and express their true identity, which they couldn't have done in a physical space. Health NGOs have used e-health, performing consultation online and sending health records safely and discreetly, giving the community access to medical services from which they were excluded previously. And there are really important e-commerce programs under development as well. But the use of social media, while a lifeline, hasn't been straightforward. Only 24.8% of the population of Bangladesh used the internet in 2020, according to World Bank data. And internet use is far more expensive than neighbouring countries. So NGOs have big challenges in terms of subsidising use of the internet. Given the level of illiteracy, local NGOs have provided training not just in how to use social media, but also in literacy. It wouldn't be possible to build a platform for Hydra and assume that it'll do the trick. The case study provides important lessons about the social and institutional scaffolding required to achieve social impact for disadvantaged communities. The second case study that I really briefly want to tell you about was conducted by Michael Rogerson about Sanseri's residential and commercial clean energy network. So one reason this project is so exciting is because it provides a model for clean energy investment in a middle-income country at a time when the clean energy divide between rich and poor countries is getting bigger. Emerging and developing economies currently account for two-thirds of the world's population, but only one-fifth of global investment in clean energy. Net zero is impossible unless the world develops, unless the world invests in developing countries. Another reason I find this project so exciting is because it deals with a problem that those of you who have solar panels will be really familiar with. You make the most solar energy when you don't need it, and when you need it, you actually have to buy it from the grid. But this is inefficient because energy has to travel far, leading to energy loss. In the Sensiri Residential and Commercial Clean Energy Network, energy harnessed from solar panels is shared across a community, a cluster of residential and commercial buildings that have different energy needs at different times. Using smart contracts that, um, underpinned by blockchain, the properties trade the electricity between themselves. Blockchain allows data to securely be available to all relevant parties on the network without the need for an intermediary. There's a few really important lessons here. The first obvious point is that the network required investment. And unfortunately, investment in renewables is in short supply outside of rich countries. And while the Sensiri initiative is in a middle income country, it's still in a relatively well off area. So there's a lot of work to do to ensure that this type of initiative 
benefits poor members of society. The second lesson is that the initiative is only possible because of a supportive regulatory environment. This kind of community energy network isn't possible in all countries, which is why the researcher scholars like RMIT's and Kelly's, a, an expert on energy regulation, is so important. D3 is visionary because it brings together scholars like Anne with Jason's team. So what I hope to do tonight is to galvanise you and ask you to join RMIT in this social impact endeavour. For those of you who are already leaders in using digital technologies for social impact, I applaud you and I ask you to bring me your stories so I can share them as inspiration for others. But regardless of whether you're a leader or just beginning your SDG journey, I ask you to join us in doubling your efforts to address the world's biggest problems using digital technologies. The rewards are going to be literally the best thing that we could ask for. The increased well-being of the planet and of the people and, uh, and creatures of this planet. Thank you. Over to you, Frank. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Shelley, Matt, and Jason. Okay. Now, I just wanted to explain a little bit more of Digital 3. And what we just um, experienced then is three of the pillars that make D Digital 3. And it's fascinating when you look at a single aspect like digital economies from multiple lenses. And that's the value proposition of D3. The underlying strengths of D3 are our research centres that collaborate with us. RMIT Centre of Cyber Security, Research and Innovation. RMIT Vietnam, Cyber Security, Research and Innovation Hub the Blockchain Innovation Hub, RMIT Vietnam Blockchain Hub, RMIT Business and Human Rights Centre, the Enterprise AI and Data Analytics Hub, and the Centre for People, Organisation and Work, plus extended um, collaboration across re researchers across RMIT, including the Digital Finance CRC. Our value proposition is that multidisciplinary view that can be mobilised and harnessed for impact. As a really quick example, a security issue does not have one solution. It requires technology, evidence, leadership, technical capability, new world business thinking and models, social media strategies, communication, marketing and future-proof solutions that ultimately protect and do no harm. That's the charter of RMIT Digital 3. But we don't do it alone. We do it with our industry partners. And I'd really like to thank and acknowledge our existing partners. Firstly, CoinSpot, Founded in 2013 and Melbourne headquartered, CoinSpot is one of Australia's leading cryptocurrency exchanges with the largest selection of blockchain assets of any Australian exchange. Secondly, Filecoin. Filecoin is a cryptocurrency that powers the Filecoin network, a decentralised peer-to-peer file storage network that aims to let anyone store, retrieve, and host digital information. Algorand is a proof of stake blockchain cryptocurrency protocol. Algorand was founded in 2017 by Silvio Michelli, a professor at MIT. The Algorand Foundation manages ecosystem 
growth on chain governance and decentralisation of the Algorand network. I'd also like to acknowledge Piper Alderman, an Australian law firm that, who works with clients across Australia and internationally to achieve optimum legal and commercial solutions. Piper Alderman advises companies dealing with digital law and is at the intersection of cutting edge technology, automation and innovation. Good Shepherd is Australia's oldest charity working to support women and girls experiencing abuse and disadvantage. Good Shepherd provides services and support in the areas of family and domestic violence, financial security and youth experiencing disadvantage. And finally, Mythical Games, a San Francisco-based gaming technology studio who are developing a new generation of games that have true ownership of digital assets. These new economies based on digital ownership will bring players, developers and content creators closer to the games that they love. These partnerships are strong and bring in added value to D3, but that important industry experience to allow us to make greater impact. I'd now like to hand over to our industry panel and introduce to you our facilitator, um, Chris Berg. Chris is co-director of the Blockchain Innovation Hub. Chris is a writer, speaker, academic, political commentator, policy analyst, economist, historian, seeking to understand the past and the future of individual liberty and technology change. I don't know where you find the time. <laughs> w welcome, Chris. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Firstly, Lorraine Finlay. Finlay. Uh, Lorraine is the Human Rights Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission. Lorraine has, in, in this role, Lorraine has particular responsibility for protecting and promoting fundamental rights and freedoms, including freedom of speech, religion, movement and association. Lorraine also, also leads the work of the Commission in areas including modern slavery, asylum seekers, refugees, business and human rights, and technology and human rights. Welcome, Lorraine. <laughs> and welcome to Catherine Eibner. Catherine is head of global innovation programs for Australia and New Zealand public sector at Amazon Web Services, AWS. Catherine works with sector customers to innovate on delivery of their mission and leveraging Amazon's best practices, such as sharing how Amazon innovates, Amazon's culture of innovation using the cloud, and to experiment on new ideas to solve challenging problems. Welcome, Catherine. <laughs> Now I'd like to introduce Karen Cohen, founder and program manager of Algo Hub. Karen is also known as Block Mum. Karen is the founder and program manager of Algo Hub, the developer and student community of the Algorand Foundation. She also founded Emerging Tech Talent, a company that helps humans connect to emerging technologies. Karen is the founder of Women Emerging in Emerging Tech, Women Who Crypto, and co-organiser for the Women in Blockchain Australia. Welcome, Karen. <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce Michael. Michael Bessina is a partner within um, Piper Alderman, and Michael advises companies dealing with digital law, the intersection of cutting edge technology, automation and innovation. Michael is a former software developer and has a rare combination of talent, regulatory and legal skills, which he leverages to assist his clients. Welcome, Michael. Uh, 
So we didn't realise when we invited Michael that he'd broken his leg, um, but you seem pretty spry on it. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Um, thanks um, uh, everyone for joining us. Um, it's been a great selection of presentations so far today. Um, we've got a, 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 about 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, there's an option to give some um, questions on the Slido as well, and they'll just show up here. But before I go to audience questions, actually, Catherine, I'd like to start with you. Um, uh, we've talked a lot about the digital economy. In your role at AWS, how do you see that it's changing? I sort of feel that the digi digital is, it feels like the water in, that we drink right now. It's just, it, it's, in the, it's in the air. How is it changing for you and how do you think it's gonna change into the future? You're just gonna start with an easy question. Right? Yeah, no, no. Yeah, I, okay. I, we'll start small and we'll go big yeah, okay. after that. Um, probably the thing that I'm seeing the most, and um, I've been with AWS for almost five years. I come from a startup background um, and have worked a lot in the software development ecosystems in Australia for over 20 years. And the thing that I'm seeing change the most, which I'm very happy to see, is the appetite and urgency for change. So people are far more willing to identify these challenges, such as the, the goals, the, the, um, the development goals, looking at how we can align technology and experiment rapidly to try and solve some of those things. We don't have the answers, but there's a willingness now for people to move faster with purpose and intent. And that really excites me because I think um, doing nothing is the worst thing we could possibly do. And there's just so many challenges that face patience, students, citizens, people like you, me, and future generations, that if we don't solve now, is gonna have irrevocable consequences. And now is the time for us to be bringing groups together, such as the way D3 is gonna be structured, to move faster with purpose, because speed matters, and it matters now. And I'm excited to see that urgency start to come out in the customers and the engagements that we're working on. And just to follow up, so you see that's a, that's a significant change. Mm. So it's always struck me that, you know, digital just seems to happen to us. Um, we, we live in a world of innovation, but you're, uh, 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 part of the digital three or the D3 thesis is that we can drive that change. We can actually, we can, we can integrate it into and direct it towards the goals that we want now. And you see that happening through industry itself. Yeah, I do. And I see it being, there's an intent there. So people, I am seeing more willingness to take risks because the risk of failure is lower. I think as Australians, we tend to think of failure as a bad thing and there's been a mind shift around it being learning based, not failure based. And how can we take steps to learn more from what we're doing and then share that knowledge so that we can continue to build on that knowledge as groups. And I'm seeing that translate into some fantastic advancements in technologies that um, we're working with um, in some of the engagements that we've been doing, but also across what I'm seeing the university doing as well. Um, so, Michael, I'll bring you in here. So, um, uh, your, your legal practice is very much focused on technology and, and frontier technologies, and you've done a lot of work in, in, in blockchain-related fields and so forth. But, but the law itself is changing, and the way that people interact with the law, um, uh, legal fields itself, we've got um, uh, uh, law programs at RMIT that are studying the application of AI to law, or blockchain to law. How, how do you sort of see the future of your of your discipline, of your industry, um, uh, and, and how can we address it? Again, small questions, small, and then we'll move questions. to the big ones. Yeah, yeah. I'll just solve a few problems <laughs> at once. Um, I think the only constant is change, and even within my practice where we're working in a lot of cutting edge space and feel that we're behind and we spend all day in, mostly in blockchain tech, but cutting edge tech, um, so when I step out from that and talk to other lawyers, it reminds me of how the law moves slowly as a feature, not a bug, which is very much part of our political system and tradition here, but that creates always issues around that, uh, that early adoption and the cutting edge and people who are willing to take that risk and move into a space that the law is not gonna catch up with for a number of years. We saw it happen with the internet um, and the digital happened with the internet and then the law slowly caught up to it. Um, but it's interesting to see that cases are emerging around the world which are relying probably, probably more than usual on different case law and reported decisions in disparate countries because there just hasn't been very many reported decisions, say, outside of America. Um, and that's building a, a position of jurisprudence that's, that's coming from a common law tradition internationally, which is quite interesting to see. Uh, but it's, it's a real challenge. And you know, that's why the initiatives like D3 is so important because cutting across all the silos that exist. Because in law, there's a, just a ridiculous number of silos that you can become very, very specialized on this obscure area of stamp duty and tax and run a career in it or some other amazingly specialized zone. 
but all this technology cuts across these um, silos and if you know the, the lawyers of tomorrow, the law students of today aren't getting across that, um, then they're going to be working that traditional silo. And they need to get, it, get out and across it because that's where all the growth is going to be. I mean, we think a lot about this in the university context as well. I, I think it's a similar process that we need to train students not just for the technologies of today, but we need to train students for the technologies that we don't know are going to exist in 5, 10, 15 years um, for as long as their degree is going to be relevant. Yeah, I mean, I think that you've got a very similar problem. We're dealing with uncertainty, uncertainty about the future. You're dealing with uncertainty about a legal regime that's not even even clear. Can you communicate to your clients that, um, you know, we, we don't know, technology changes, the law changes, you know, try it out and see. <laughs> well, well, unfortunately, that is something that we have to do where we hit that wall and say, look, we're here to say what the law is. We can't tell people what we hope it would be. Um, but by being at least flagging, okay, there's risks here and here's some things that might be higher or lower on a risk spectrum, that can at least help people balance their risk appetite and what they might be doing if they're in a really cutting edge project. But also part of the you know, fun element of what we get to do is getting inside the design side. I think as Professor Potts said around, there's so much more thought being given to what's happening at the design end to try and put things in a direction that's going to have a really useful outcome. So I was extremely grateful that I did economics as my other degree <laughs> because so much of the interesting things happening in tech have this economic incentive basis that then has to interact with law. And it's really, really fascinating to me. So. We asked that he said that as an economist, uh, amongst my other roles. Um, Karen, I'd like to bring you in here, and it, it's actually really exciting to have you on the panel because um, it, you're, you're really at the cutting face of particularly Web3, the blockchain industry, and it, it, it operates so differently. It's so community-focused. Um, how, how can we... How can we bring students and industry along to not just changing technologies and a changing industry, but a changing way of doing things? Thanks, Chris. Um, just a fun fact, I used to be a lecturer here at RMIT in HR, and um, I worked here so long ago that I used to melt the slides in the photocopier, because <laughs> we had overheads, we didn't have PowerPoint then. We were going to do that for this, but they said yeah. there's better So I'm options. really excited to see technology change. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think the students, and this is where we really acknowledge with the Algorand Foundation, um, for those of you that don't know Algorand, we're a layer one um, blockchain, fast, cheap, secure, green, very important, the green bit. Uh, and so uh, there's a $50 million investment in um, universities globally and very proud to be a supporter of the D3 um, solution as well here at RMIT. So if we don't work with the students and we don't educate the students, really we're lagging behind. These guys are, are going to be the leaders in community. And uh, we've actually seen, I don't know if any of you have seen the AM project. Um, he's been over at the Blockchain Innovation Centre. So um, he brought his project in looking at tax and how we can use tax and crypto, for instance. So, you know, looking at that from a multidisciplinary approach, that'd be great to bring in all the different angles, not just the developers, into his project. And, and so I think that's just a small example of how we can be improving community with, with this project. And, and when we've been thinking about Digital 3, it's always been about this idea that students, particularly when we think about our student offerings, it's not just about, well, they're going to be a lawyer or they're going to be an accountant or they're going to be an economist or what have you. They're going to be facing unpredictable industry environments that they're gonna need skills from everything. And you see that as well um, when you're working with, with young people and young entrepreneurs too. Yeah, I'm really lucky because we've been running, um, you know, global hackathons looking at ideas from all over the world. And um, you just get to see these amazing ideas and these thoughts that go into these labs and um, they're unhinged. They can just do whatever they want and, uh, and they practice on the blockchain. So it's fabulous to see that, that thinking and I think uh, working with RMIT we've been um, doing hackathons and um, and we're about to launch a, a Pi-Teal boot camp uh, for any of you that want to be able to program on the blockchain it's free uh, so come along uh, yeah I think I just love to see all these fabulous ideas of what people can do and doing good for the world as well so you know um, I know that Mariella from Meadow Labs is here. Uh, they're working with Australia Zoo at the moment um, and all the money is going from the NFT sales to the Australia Zoo conservation. Uh, so you get to see projects like that. They're about to drop their, their third NFT, which is a turtle. Uh, and previous to that with some koalas and some crocs. So I'm enjoying collecting those as well and doing good for the world. 
Awesome. So, um, Lorraine, it's it's also really great to have you here because, I mean, your field is human rights. Um, uh, the 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 um, Australian Human Rights Commission is about thirty years old. The concept of human rights is thousands of years old, or at least um, uh, two or three thousand years old. Um, how has it changed? I mean, so what, obviously it changed greatly, but how does it how has it suddenly changed because of digital? And what new challenges does all this stuff that's in the air bring? Well, I think the most important point to make first up is the fundamentals haven't changed. So when we're talking about innovation and revolutions, the heart of human rights is their enduring foundational principles that are actually really well suited to the digital age because they operate without borders. So the idea that every human being has this fundamental value, that doesn't change. We're just applying it in slightly different contexts. And that's what I think is really exciting about this collaboration and project. The fact that human rights concerns are coming in right from the very beginning and that we're talking about them as part of the conversation rather than just being an add-on that we suddenly realise exists and we have to think about when a crisis hits. So that idea of embedding human rights every step along the way is really important because we shouldn't do tech just for tech's sake. We need to think about why are we actually doing this and what's the benefit. And one of the really exciting things, I think, looking at everything that you've been talking about tonight, my role often involves reacting to crises and talking about risks to human rights, particularly in relation to te technology. And something that I think we really need to explore a lot more is the benefits to human rights and the way tech can actually be used to strengthen and uplift and empower people because there are some really powerful opportunities out there. It's just a matter of thinking through really carefully right from the beginning how we can best do that. Uh, you, you, that's really interesting. Your, your role is not just to to focus on um, human rights; it's to uh, on on particular breaches or, or or various things. It's actually to communicate the values of human rights, and uh, and we haven't really touched on it that much. Although the the AI imagery was useful, the way we are doing what we are doing is different now. And so, I presume the role of a human rights commissioner per se is to operate not just about the digital environment, but in the digital environment as well. Has digital has all this stuff, has that changed the job? Has that changed how one communicates these ideas? In a whole variety of different ways. It raises new challenges in terms of how we conceptualise, for example, the protection and enforcement of human rights, because traditionally human rights at the international scale has been done through nation states. And that's something very different when you're talking about the digital world. So how do we adapt to those challenges? But even in so far as at a practical level, the learnings that we can take, the connections that we can have, the understandings that we have about human rights and what's happening in far-flung places around the world, you really do get this global sense of community that is um, far more real and far more immediate um, than's happened before. And I think Shelley touched on a lot of that when she was talking about, you know, technology allowing us to see issues on a global scale that we weren't really able to see in such a personal and direct way before. And in some respects, that's really exciting because it can really empower people and create enormous opportunities. It can also be really terrifying because the very same technology that can be used to uplift and empower people in one aspect can also be used for very different purposes. So that's, I think, another reason why this conversation is so important. So I'm keenly aware that I'm the one holding us off going to drinks, but I've got a lot of really, really great questions. I've got a lot of questionable questions about as well here. I've got questions like, will RMIT D3 do a cryptocurrency airdrop, for example? And we wouldn't tell you right now if we were, would we? Oh, could RMIT become a DAO one day? Again, we wouldn't tell you, and we'd have to get it legally cleared, which <laughs> Michael will tell me is very difficult. What is the metaverse? I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. Actually, I've, I've got a question that I wouldn't mind passing um, to Catherine, actually. Um, from your perspective, um, what should D3 do to be considered a success in five or ten years' time? What, what, would, make, you know, th what would make this initiative work? Outcomes. I think really... Is that all? Oh, okay. Well, well, that's easy. I know. Well, it was an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I truly believe we need to be having measurable impact on these challenges that we've shared today. And I think by bringing together researchers, industry, and greatest minds that we have available, experimenting on how we can solve it, bringing it back to purpose, and making sure that we're solving the things that are actually going to have meaningful change in the world, it's going to drive those outcomes that will achieve that sense of purpose that will continue to grow the flywheel 
and grow a successful business here in D3. I think it, that's the secret. Um, Karen, I'll, I'll actually throw the same question to you as well. What, what, what would work? What, what would be a success from your perspective as someone at the coalface of the crypto industry? I just love the multidisciplinary approach. So, you know, rather than leaving the world of tech just to the developers who come up with great ideas, I'd love to see the legal aspects, the tax aspects, the economic aspects, the human rights aspects, like well-rounded graduates of this centre uh, coming out because uh, I think we need that diversity of thinking across the industry. Um, uh, Lorraine, just quickly, how can we how can we work better? I mean, uh, the the Human Rights Centre that we have works really closely with the human rights community, but how can we do so in a very holistic way that brings across not just uh, dedicated human rights attention, but cybersecurity? How can we integrate AI? Those sorts of things, from your perspective. Do you know, there's actually no magic answer to it. It is literally well, about... Well, that's a pain. I know. Um, it's literally about getting people... I'm going to say in the same room. That's a very physical way of thinking about it. But it's about bringing those people together to make sure that you're actually talking the same language. I mean, what we found at the Human Rights Commission with the Technology and Human Rights Project that we did was the hardest thing was bridging that gap between the tech experts and the human rights people because, you know, I would, you know, put forward something and the tech people would say... But that just isn't how it works. So having that match between the theory and the practice is so critical if you're actually going to get the type of outcomes that you want um, to drive things forward. I'm um, just, can I jump yeah, in please. here just for a sec? One of the things I find fascinating about that is a lot of our engagement, the huge majority of time is spent bringing in the voice of the customer because people who are trying to solve the problem often have good intentions, but they don't deeply understand the problem space or they haven't lived it. So you really have to make sure that you are going to the source to understand the true problem or opportunity to deliver those benefits. Because if you don't understand it, then you're solving what you think you need to solve and quite often there's a mismatch here. And Michael, the most in question, how could we become a DAO? <laughs> <laughs> or more, more, more general. How should we deal with? How should we deal with questions that we don't know the answers to? <laughs> I was going to take that question on notice and come back, <laughs> possibly with a letter of engagement. Um, <laughs> look, the answer, and it's the same answer to your previous question as well. Conveniently, with the outcomes and dealing with these questions, we don't know the answer to is education, because the biggest challenge that I see all the time out in the business world and in the certainly in the government world as well, when we're trying to do, deal with regulation and fix the laws that are trailing behind by design is the education gap. So I think that being able to try and solve, the, solve for things that we don't know the answer to is an education solution and also as is the result of D3 could be measured on, in my opinion, how much education, how many more people we bring in to understand these technologies, be able to work in this way to identify the problem clearly and bridge the gap. Because a huge number of people are out there at the moment bridging the gap if they have the right skills to do it, but we need more of them because there's is a generational move to have that kind of shift to retool and bring up a tech stack for a whole OS upgrade for the economy as I'll, I'll steal from Professor Potts. Steal from Jason, yeah. Yes. Well, that, thank you so much. I'd really like to um, thank uh, Lorraine, Catherine, Michael and Karen. So thank you. That was just absolutely fantastic. So thank you. Thank you to our industry guests. And thank you, Chris, for facilitating such a um, enthusiastic but great discussion. And a lot more for us to cover later on. As we approach the close, there's just a few things I'd like to say. First of all, we have an open invitation to partner with D3 whether that's partnering on research, whether that's accessing um, the thought leadership, participating in our education programs, or um, sponsoring and working with students and the talent pipeline that we intend to build and are building. If you'd like to find out more about that, please don't hesitate to contact Michael Fairburn, and that's his LinkedIn um, QR code, or me, or look on our um, web page within the college so that you can learn more about partnering with us and studying with us. But I want to demonstrate our commitment back to community and to industry. 
and we are committing to regularly release short courses to build new capabilities and career opportunities. These courses will be available online and they'll be offered at no cost. The first new course is doing business in Web3 and if you'd like early access to that program, please scan that QR code or look on um, social media and also our web pages. This program is a six week practical introduction to the world of Web3 and a roadmap of decisions and actions needed to embark on a Web3 business. As mentioned by Matt Warren, the next short course also to be offered at no cost is Safety by Design, and this is a four-week program. The Web3 program is six weeks. This four-week short course will be released within the next few months. Early next year, D3 will release Advancing Social Impact with Digital Technologies. This is a six-week course consisting of real-world application of di digital technology to promote humanitarian objectives and address humanitarian issues. This is a fantastic opportunity for us to demonstrate the combined, aggregated, integrated value of not only RMIT D3, but also of RMIT. And on behalf of the College and of Business and Law and also RMIT University, I thank everyone for attending. I also thank the army of people that have worked to get us to this point and also to ensure that tonight is smooth and hopefully enjoyable. If you're able to, please join us for some refreshments and drinks in the salon and to access the salon the two side access have automatic doors that will take you through to the um, Capitol Theatre Salon. And just a reminder that RMIT College of Business and Law stands very proudly at the intersection of business, technology and law with social impact. So thank you all for coming and I look forward to meeting more of you over the refreshments. Thank you.